All right, okay. So this is another example uh, that we work on <coughs> the biosensor. Okay, yes, that is. So this one we are using uh, electrochemical again. Okay, just now is is not to say electrochemical, but it's electrical based transducer. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is the normal one eh, that that is being carried out if you are to analyze RNA based virus. Eh? Um, even COVID as well, because COVID is COVID nineteen is RNA virus. COVID nineteen is the disease. The virus name is SARS CoV two. Okay, so uh, blood samples you have to do RNA extraction, which is quite difficult, and convert into what we call as cDNA. Okay, the cDNA is because RNA is not stable, so we have to convert into cDNA to have a stable. Uh, sample to be analyzed, okay, and then we have to do amplification, <laughs> so extraction, remember, and then amplification, purification, all right, before, uh, before that, and then probably using electrophoresis yeah, to detect whether you have a match or not. So this one, uh, you know, is very time consuming. So if, if it is possible that we change into something simpler. Uh, but still, uh, in the NA biosensor, we, we still have this issue. Uh, we still cannot escape the extraction, the purification, but at least we can escape. Uh, why is not moving? Okay. At least we can escape the electrophoresis part. Okay. But nowadays, uh, of course, we are working on uh, a, a much more sophisticated biosensor where we can incorporate all these uh, extraction, amplification, all in the, in the biosensor itself. So now it can be done, of course. So you can see that uh, once we have the sample ready, it is uh, deposited, it is introduced onto uh, an electrode. Okay. And then based on the hybridization, we can conclude. Okay, whether uh, it is dengue positive or it is not dengue positive, eh? it is negative. All right. So I'm not going to show all this, uh, but this is just to show to you that there are some uh, <clears throat> uh, works that we have to do. These are the amount of work that we have to do. So it's not that easy. <laughs> uh, as easy that you can think of is so. Uh, so the first thing that you need to do is, of course, to identify a correct gene sequence for the uh, DNA probe. Yeah, right. Okay, let me go back to this one. So the DNA probe, okay, that we wish to put on top of the uh, electrode, okay, has to represent the gene sequence of the. Uh, dengue virus. If this uh, DNA probe uh, is not correct, okay, then of course you're going to get uh, a wrong reading. <laughs> so that's the the problem. That's the biggest okay challenges. The first step that you have to do is to identify the correct gene sequence. And usually, because uh, many people has done on the molecular parts. So for us who are working on biosensor, we rely on them. So we need the sequence from them before we can construct the biosensor itself. So this one is the DNA extracted from the sample. Okay. So, <clears throat> so those are very important. Uh, nowadays, uh, if you are to like, uh, you need to have the sequence of DNA. There are many companies who can supply that provided that you give them the sequence, they can synthesize for you. So it's not that difficult. Eh? So uh, what we're going to do is not to discuss DNA biosensor until the transducer part, because transducer part means that electrochemical, optical, or other techniques we will discuss in a different part. 
So what I'm going to do today is to share, uh, to discuss another biomarker, which is the anti, uh, antibody. Okay, so that will be the, the DNA. So before I proceed to antibody, any question on the DNA biosensor? It's okay, we will revisit, but it's using a, a transducer. A discussion will be on the transducer. It is electrochemical, optical. Okay, so I think we can just proceed. Okay. This one we will revisit, so no issues, no, no problem on that matter. So the second part will be antibody. <laughs> so I think, uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, this is something that uh, we have learned during uh, secondary schools. If you remember that uh, antibody antigen, yeah? antibody and antigen uh, interaction, <clears throat> they are just like lock and key. Okay, so uh, everybody know now know about the antigen test kit that we use for COVID nineteen. So. So antigen means that these are the one that comes from the virus, okay? It's easier for us to, to understand that antigen is the protein, is the uh, parts that come from the virus. So the antibody is the one that will capture. So I will show you uh, the, the detail of the antibody structure. <clears throat> so it's still chemistry. Uh, so the, there are parts that has carboxylic uh, acid <clears throat> and uh, these are the uh, amine uh, where the antigen binding site happened antigen this is the one that captured the virus okay uh, the, so they are very specific interaction uh, antigen antibody okay uh, they are so if we are to look at the big, big bigger picture okay you can see uh, the purple one okay the purple one is is an example of bacteria. Okay, so bacteria is big yeah, compared to virus, and uh, they are what we call as epitopes. <laughs> epitopes, uh, uh, the 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 antibody, okay, will have, uh, will interact, eh, will interact with specific epitopes uh, on the on the surface of the the bacteria or virus, okay? So bacteria is very big. You can see that uh, this antibody, the epitopes is the con, uh, the, this is not triangle, con shape, <laughs> okay? It will not bind to the cubic shape, okay? It will not bind to the, to the uh, round shape, epitopes, okay? So whenever that we have uh, a specific antibody, it means that the antibody will try will interact with the specific epitopes on, uh, that is on the virus or on the bacteria itself, okay? So this is very important to understand uh, because if we don't have any uh, selective interaction, then of course the detection is not going to be selective. In medical, uh, medical uh, application, of course, selectivity is very, very important because we do not want any false positive or false negative results. Yeah? So if you look at here, there are two types that I know of, polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies. Again, this is the antigen. Antigen means bacteria, virus, and there are certain epitopes okay, where the, the antibody can react, okay, right? And if it is monoclonal antibody, uh, the, the interaction is much more selective. Okay, it's much more selective, meaning that it will bind to a very specific epitope just now. Yeah? But for polyclonal, it might have, uh, it, it can probably bind to more than one epitopes, yeah? probably. So it is called polyclonal for that purpose. It can bind uh, with one or more epitopes on the virus or the bacteria. So this actually, uh, there are pro, pros and cons, uh, advantage and disadvantages using polyclonal or monoclonal. Sometimes uh, it is good to have polyclonal 
uh, depends on the uh, application or sometimes you can, uh, it's better to use monoclonal, yeah? So I'm just going to show an example of, uh, this is SARS-CoV-2, okay? Uh, SARS actually is, is uh, not, is coronavirus in general, I think. Uh, but this is, okay, the picture that really scares us before, okay? Uh, still today, okay? So if we have the, the, the test strip, yeah, the test strip that we are currently using. So there are a different antigen, yeah, different antigen that is being detected. So these are the structures. So the antigen that being det detected, okay, uh, by the antibody, it probably N protein and probably S protein. So there are certain issues. S protein, they have, they are easily mute. Uh, the mutation, the mutation of S protein is very high. So that's why we have a lot of uh, variant, okay, uh, variant of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is due to the S protein. Yeah. So remember that this is the one that hooked to your, not, not <laughs> to our uh, cell. Uh, in the lung, so this is the one that hope to that destroy that uh, the the first entrance to the cell in the lung, yeah, the S protein. There are also antigen test kit that but based on N protein. Yeah, so N protein uh, is is not prone to mutation, so it's more stable. But unfortunately, N protein uh, is too general sometimes. It's too general, so we cannot identify between different variants. Uh, or, for example, if we have SARS CoV 1 or SARS CoV 2, eh, because uh, they're also uh, coronavirus uh, MERS eh, uh, that comes from, uh, I don't, that, that was once in the Middle East. Eh? Uh, so those are uh, some what we call as uh, possible uh, that we cannot detect uh, to differentiate between all those coronavirus. So that's why many are based on S protein. But unfortunately, the S protein is uh, it's not stable and it mutates. Eh? It's, it easily mutates. Okay. So what you will see actually. Okay, just let me jump through the, okay. So what is we are using uh, for the antigen test kit, okay? So this is what you see. This is your sal saliva <laughs> that contains the virus, okay? And this is the antibody specific to the just now, if we are to design the test kit based on the S protein, means that the antibody, the Y shape just now, is specific towards this S protein. Okay? All right? And if so, you can see that <clears throat> uh, when we mix together, this is where you put the saliva, right? Uh, you have to wait for the, the, the whole thing to move. So they start to move and you will see a control line as well as a test line, okay? So the, the control line contains uh, antibody that is general, yeah? that is general and it will react with uh, many proteins. So that's why uh, you will observe the control line easily, okay? So if you only observe the control line, meaning that you have other proteins in your saliva. So it, this is uh, the the production is using a very general uh, antibody set. Okay, now if it is positive, you can see that the Y, the antibody, the Y-shaped structure is interacting, eh? is capturing <laughs> uh, the analyte, which is the, the virus, specifically on the S protein, yeah? specifically attaching itself on the S protein if the antigen is based on S protein a specific antibody. So if it is based on N protein antibody, it will, you can see it is a bit difficult because it is inside. Yeah? So most of the time we use S protein. 
Okay, so this is how we the 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 amino sorry immunosensor work. Eh? Just now is DNA it is based on hybridization, but immuno is based on the interaction of antibody antigen. So the biggest difference that you can see, uh, DNA requires extraction. Eh? DNA requires extraction before and then purification before the it can react, uh, form, hybridize. But if we are to use antigen-antibody interaction, uh, the beautiful thing about antigen-antibody interaction, it, it does not require uh, a very complicated sample pretreatment. Okay, you don't have to do extraction, you don't have to do um, purification. You can just uh, directly use saliva, for example. <laughs> you can directly use sputum. You can directly use uh, uh, urine. Yeah? But unfortunately, if we use like blood sample because it is based on color, okay, you can you will observe the purple color. Okay, blood might interfere with the color, so that's why I, I don't know. Uh, it has to be filtered first before you can use the uh, like this kind of uh, detection scheme. So apart from test strip, <clears throat> okay, this one is test strip, apart from it, of course you can use uh, what we call as ELISA, uh, ELISA plate, okay? So uh, this, it's just a matter of different uh, type of reagent, but the, the principle is the same. Yeah, the principle is the same. Just just a moment. Yeah, so you can see that uh, on the ELISA plate, we can put the the what we call as capture antibody that is specific to the virus or to the bacteria. Okay, and this. Uh, capture antibody is of, is interacting the specific epitope just now okay with the bacteria or with the virus and then we have in order for us yeah, to have the color just now okay you can see that the yellow colored is actually gold nanoparticle yeah? it's gold nanoparticle the one that you use for your test strip is actually gold nanoparticle that give us the naked eye uh, detection that, that enable us to see the color uh, production. If not, that we cannot see, of course. Uh -huh. So uh, let's say if we are to use another, okay, you can use enzyme as the tagging. So this one, I'm not going to discuss at this moment because I'm just going to discuss uh, introduce to you immunosensor and what's the difference uh, with uh, DNA biosensor. Okay, so hopefully by the uh, by now it's already six forty three by seven we're gonna uh, complete the three biomarkers, uh, which is the <clears throat> the last one is the aptamer. Okay, all right, so. Uh, this is our work on TB uh, antigen test kit. Okay, uh, so th these are the things that we have done. Uh, so similar to COVID nineteen, <coughs> so it can be used. We also use it in uh, using electrochemical technique. But this one we will discuss when it comes to uh, transducer discussion. Yeah? So the third uh, biomarker is aptama. Okay, so what are aptamers? <clears throat> so uh, aptamers are single stranded folded. Yeah? Just now the NDA is also single stranded. Yeah? It's, a genes, uh, it's a gene sequence it's specific to the uh, analyte. But for aptamers, it's, it's based on, it's actually a holding protein <laughs> that bind to molecular targets with high affinity and specificity. So you can see here uh, the example, but also we have like these pictures, okay? So aptamers, okay? So this is the aptamer probe, okay? This is the aptamer probe, okay? 
And uh, this is the sensor surface, regardless of what kind of sensors. And this is the target. So for aptamer, the beauty of aptamer it is it does not only react with another DNA sequence. Eh? It can react with protein. It can react with uh, metabolites. It can react with drugs. It can react, sometimes if you design it well, it can react with different target that you wish to detect. Yeah? But it has to be designed properly. Yeah? So this is what the difference between antibody-based immunosensor just now <clears throat> and aptamer-based, yeah? aptamer sensor. So you can see that uh, antibody requires in vivo uh, production uh, where you have to like deal with rabbits yeah? to produce the antibody. And these are the disadvantages of using antibody, what, even though it's, it's simpler than DNA. Okay? But using aptamer, uh, if you design it well, <laughs> okay? if you design it well, uh, then aptama is cheaper because it is chemically synthesized. You don't have to produce it through animals. And uh, it, it, it no not to say no variation at all, but in terms of reproducibility, it is uh, much better compared to antibody because antibody has uh, variations eh, when you um, uh, produce it in batches, eh, different batches. So this is how it looks. Okay. Um, after abdomen is much robust, you can detect different types of um, many different types of uh, target or analyte. If you compare to DNA, it has to match with DNA. Okay, DNA has to match with another DNA from the species, from the protein. But abdomen, you can uh, design it to match uh, drugs, metabolites proteins, yeah? so it's not that, uh, um, it's much more robust okay? and it's much more practical. So this is uh, the production of uh, aptama versus the production of, uh, sorry, this is in vivo. It can be using in vivo, but I'm not going to discuss this one. This one is, is difficult, but it is called SELEX. Okay? So uh, I'm not going to discuss how Aptama is being designed yeah? because it requires a series of steps. And I, I can invite you to, uh, I can invite my students who has done uh, Aptama design to give a talk to you okay, later. So this, this requires, uh, requires, all right, a designing process before you can get the aptama. So you can see from here uh, that the aptama can fold uh, to match the shape of the protein of interest that you want to analyze. Eh? So the most important part in aptama is the design. If you can go, if you can have a good design and it managed to fold to the right structure. Uh, of the protein that you wish to analyze, the drugs that you wish to analyze, then you are good to go, right? So this one uh, is how the sensing is uh, being done by using Atoma. So this one we'll, we'll reserve for later because we have to discuss something else first, okay? So those are the, uh, <clears throat> the three uh, biomarkers, okay? Those are the three biomarkers that is commonly used. I'm not saying that there are only three, <laughs> but these are three commonly used in development of biosensor. And of course, uh, uh, in, uh, later that I also can share you with a chemical marker. But unfortunately, when we talk about chemical marker, it's not that selective. Okay? The problem is it's not that selective. So it can be used for just monitoring. For example, you want to monitor heavy metals in water. There are certain reagents, eh? chemical reagents that is, uh, uh, can show a reaction towards, for example, mercury, plumber, and so on. But 
In terms of medical, uh, when you want to do disease detection, <clears throat> still biosensor is the best option. Eh? All right, so I think uh, we have to, we can stop now. Uh, it's Ramadan, <laughs> so we need to get ready. So I think uh, what we can do is to uh, at least uh, after this, we can discuss, sorry. For the antigen to come to the antibody or for the target DNA, target DNA means the one that we extract from the sample to go to the probe DNA. So it has to be strategized. <clears throat> right. So when we think about the strategy, where we need to think about the strategy, we have to think about uh, the, what is the material, the nature of the solid substrate. Okay. So whether it's going to be carbon, whether it is going to be gold, whether it's going to be silica, uh, silica, um, silica, right. The, because those are the things that I know, those are the things that I work with. There are so many other uh, material, okay, that people work with when they are developing sensors. So one is, of course, the solid substrate, means that the material, what kind of material you're working with, and which type of immobilization that you wish to choose. Okay? There are different types that we are going to discuss. <clears throat> Solution conditions. Solution condition means that, are you going to work with very harsh uh, wastewater, for example? Uh, sorry, very, very harsh conditions. Is it an extreme uh, wastewater where you want to detect uh, some chemical compound in the wastewater? So is the wastewater very dirty? Okay, so that one you have to think about. So it's going to be extreme condition, very acidic, for example, or very alkaline. So we have to choose uh, the right uh, method of immobilization. The other one is, if you look at the DNA just now, okay, the gene sequence, okay, the, the DNA probe, yeah, the one that we put on the sensor surface, it varies. You know, you can have a longer probe, or you can have a shorter probe. Okay, there's of course some advantages and disadvantages when you have a shorter probe or you have when you use a longer probe. There are, there are pros and cons, yeah? uh, of course. <clears throat> so these are among the factors. And our objective, okay, our objective when we strategize to immobilize these biomarkers, okay. Uh, we want to reduce the restriction, uh, meaning that we don't want the sensor surface to be too crowded. Okay, it should have enough uh, space for the interaction. Okay, so if you look at here, for example, yeah, this is okay. So if you look at here, uh, you can see that. This is the antibody, the biomarker that we attach to the surface of sensor. And this is the tuberculosis, back to back, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis is the bacteria yeah, that uh, causes TB, tuberculosis. So if we imagine that if we put so many antibody on top of the uh, sensor surface, it will be too crowded and the reaction is, is difficult. I mean, the, the bacteria itself uh, does not have enough space <laughs> to react with this antibody. So that is antibody antigen. Let's say if we are to discuss about DNA. Uh -huh. So imagine this, this is the DNA probe, selective or specific to its dengue virus, for example. And then we have extracted DNA uh, from the virus, from the sample. So if it is a perfect mesh, we call it this target DNA. So if this DNA are to be, to form yeah, double helix or to hybridize, then it requires some space. So if we like put a lot of things, too many things on the sensor surface, so this this process will be hindered and eh? will be uh, disturbed. So you're not going to get a good results. Okay. 
So those uh, those requires optimization means that you have to do some study to look at how much is suitable to be uh, immobilized on top of the sensor. The other one is uh, the immobilization has to be stable. We do not want when we attach the biomarker, then it simply leach out, leave the surface whenever that you uh, are doing some experiment, then it leach, it leave the surface. Yeah, so we don't want that to happen. Okay, so we have to think about a good strategy. Okay, the other one, uh, try to remember that again. I mentioned about space. Yeah? So accessibility, accessibility. So the DNA has to be standing up. <laughs> the 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 antibody also. If you look at the structure, yeah. Okay, so if you look at the antibody structure, okay, so the uh, and mine, yeah, this site, because these are the one that interact with the antigen, interact with the virus, interact with the bacteria. So if this is not exposed, then it's going to be useless. Okay, so the attachment of the antibody, the biomarker, has to be properly planned so that this part is the one that attached to the sensor, not this part. <laughs> okay, same goes with uh, <clears throat> DNA, yeah, because uh, this DNA, okay, because they, they are negative in charge, usually because they, those are nucleic acid bases, so they are negative in charge. They, uh, and we have discussed a bit on structure, it has phosphate back, backbone. So phosphate backbone also negative in charge. So they might get tangled to each other because of the charges and they might get tangled to each other. And one thing is uh, unless we use a proper chemistry, okay, we're not gonna get the DNA probe standing up. So a proper chemistry has to be uh, strategized, has to be uh, chosen so the DNA probe can stand up. If not, it will <laughs> definitely lie down. Okay, it will like lying down. Okay, I'm show. I'm going to show you what happened if we don't have, if we don't use a proper chemistry. So again, uh, restriction, accessibility, not to crowd, uh, stable. Okay? And the other biggest challenge is to non-specific binding. So as I mentioned before, in the blood sample, in the, for example, if we are studying a disease in plants, so in the plant sample, you have so many other proteins, you have so many other DNA, so the one that you wish to target, it's not going to be easy. You have what we call as non-specific binding. Because protein, they will try to attach to, if you have different charges, they will. Okay? For example, if you have positive charges on the surface of the sensor, they will try to attach themselves. So this one will uh, interfere with the reading. So these four parameters or these four challenges has to be uh, attended to in order to get a, a good biosensor or chemical sensor. <clears throat> okay, so this one is the, the same issue. Okay, uh, so I'm starting with a very simple uh, method of immobilization. Of course, even though it is simple, uh, it's not really practical, but still we, we discuss it in order to for the purpose of understanding. Yeah? So we start with simple absorption. Okay, uh, for example, a lot of sensors, okay, especially chemical, uh, electrochemical sensors, they are using carbon electrodes huh? uh, as well as optical sensors because carbon is cheap. Okay, uh, so what happened is this is going to happen if you use, if you choose to have simple absorption. Of course, it is simple. Uh, you just uh, incubate means that you dip it 
dip the sensor with the DNA probe <laughs> solution and they attach themselves to the uh, sensor surface. Yeah? Uh, but unfortunately, this is what you will get. <clears throat> this is what we will get for, for DNA. And then for, for antibody also, you will not be sure that the, the endpoint, the carboxyl endpoint attached to the sensor uh, to the sensor surface. And if you can imagine, if this happens, okay, uh, you're not going to get a very good reading. Of course, the, hybrid, the hybridization will not happen because of the accessibility. And uh, let's say if it is um, antibody also, then you're not going to have a good interaction with antigen. So this is what we, uh, I mean, going to face if you choose simple absorption. So probably simple absorption suitable. Eh? It might be suitable if you are using uh, biomarkers or chemical markers that is not sensitive uh, uh, function, uh, what do you call? Um, I forgot. The, <laughs> the functional group, okay? Uh, it's not sensitive. I mean, you, you don't really care about the functional group. Uh, probably you have ionophore, you have a chemical reagent like dyes. Okay? So you can just dump it <laughs> on the, the sensor surface. So it's, it's going to interact anyway. But for those with uh, sensitive orientation, for example, for DNA as well as antibody, then this one is not suitable. Yeah. So those uh, but, uh, chemical markers that does not have uh, orientation sensitive, you can just use this simple absorption. Yeah. All right. Uh, so this is the implication of using uh, simple absorption. If you are using, if you target for DNA biosensor, then of course these issues uh, are going to happen. Yeah. All right. The other way you can also use polymers eh? instead of just uh, uh, carbon simple absorption, uh, you can use polymers, okay? So you can see there is a possibility that you put uh, the DNA probe, okay, inside polymers because polymers, they have porosity. They have certain uh, porosity, so you can uh, try to force the DNA probe to stand up <laughs> by putting them in nanoporous structure, okay, nanoporous structure. But uh, I don't know, because the possibility of uh, the target DNA, eh? you imagine that the target DNA uh, from, the, from the extracted sample will have to come here and diffuse in order to hybridize with, with the DNA probe. So there is a possibility of difficulty <laughs> of interaction. Uh, the target DNA not, ab not able to diffuse. It might be it might able to diffuse, but it will take some time. Yeah? <clears throat> so these are the strategies, okay, because we have uh, polymers with different charges, okay, with positive charges. For example, we have kytosan, polyaniline, polypyrrole, P dot, this is called P dot, okay. So they are very uh, useful polymers, but if we like based on charges, because the DNA, uh, the phosphate backbone of the DNA is negative, so they can interact with the positive charge of the polymer. But as you can see, uh, there is a possibility of a good uh, of hybridization like here, but <laughs> for us uh, in DNA biosensor, we prefer not to choose this because of the, the dense uh, surface area, yeah? uh, sensor surface. So uh, it's possible, but not preferred. Yeah? For immobilization through a polymer membrane to work effectively requires the, the DNA probe to be entrapped within the polymer such that it can't diffuse out of polymer membrane. Preventing the DNA by being able to diffuse also precludes target, means that the target DNA also uh, might have difficulty to diffuse and hybridize with the probe DNA. So 
these are the uh, issues. Yeah? All right. Now, the third one, of course, we use covalent. So, this involves a chemistry. Yeah? Uh, uh, <clears throat> a chemistry uh, on the sensor surface means that if you have this is GC, means carbon. Okay. So, carbon alone, okay, probably not suitable. Uh, so, what we can do is we modify with certain chemical compound. You can see we, we modify the, the carbon surface with medical, com uh, medical chemical compound. <laughs> so we modify the sensor surface with certain chemical compound. You can see in the end we have carboxyl. Yeah? Carboxylate. Carboxylate. So it's, it's, it's a sum of a simple chemistry. So I'm not talking about complicated chemistry. So we have carboxylate. Okay. And this is the DNA probe. Okay. The one that we want to attach to the uh, sensor surface. Now, okay. So please pay attention to this functional group. Okay. So in order uh, to have a covalent, Attachment, yeah? covalent is covalent bond, yeah? a very stable bond. So we can actually modify the, the, the end of the DNA probe with certain functional group. So we have worked with uh, sulfur, thiol, yeah? we call it thiol group, and we also have uh, worked with amine group. So this one, not, not to worry, because usually when we order the DNA probe, we can just ask the supplier, can we have aminated DNA or we have thiolated DNA? So they can prepare for us this uh, uh, DNA probe that has functional group. So now you can see that uh, this is quite a common chemistry where the carboxylate will form and what we call as amide bond. Yeah? Amide bond with uh, am amine. So in the end, you will get this. And the, the DNA probe will attach to the uh, this uh, amide bond. Okay. So this is one simple strategy that you can choose to have carboxylate. Uh, this, this compound is fine. Okay. Whatever compound that has carboxylate that you can attach it with the aminated DNA probe, then you can have a good attachment or immobilization of uh, single strand DNA or the DNA probe. So next step, of course, the one that I mentioned before, hybridization with the extracted DNA, then you get the, the whole things uh, good to go, right? So I'm just telling you when we do a, 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 a research on DNA biosensor, so these are the DNA that usually we ordered. Yeah? Uh, we need to have the probe DNA. <laughs> okay. And then I mentioned about just now, uh, we can request for special N group, uh, or we call it linker. Okay. What, whether it can be dilated or it can be aminated. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the, the rest of the, the most important is this one. Yeah. The, the DNA probe. This one is only uh, when we need to do characterization because uh, you don't actually uh, expose the sensor straight away to the real sample, the serum, blood, or any other real sample. But we test it uh, with synthetic, yeah? synthetic first. So we also order what we call, what we call as target DNA, some mis mismatch, and uh, non-complementary. So ju please just don't look at this, focus on this. So this is what uh, DNA probe looks like. It's actually a series of nucleic acid, yeah? <clears throat> the ATCG. So this one represents the gene of that specific virus or bacteria or microbes, yeah? fungus, for example. Yeah? So when means that the uh, when we talk about DNA, we know that, okay, if we test the DNA, then we know that it's specific, to, supposed to be that someone's specific, okay? So this is also another strategy. Uh, if we can oxidize the surface of carbon, carbon nanotubes, 
graphene, yeah, you're gonna get um, carboxyl, and then with uh, EDC NHS chemistry, you can Google EDC NHS chemistry, you can have amide bonds. So, so this is the same thing. So apart from DNA, we have to think about, for example, if we wish to uh, attach uh, other proteins. What about if we have antibody? Okay, so antibody, uh, because we need to attach the uh, carboxyl part, if you remember that. How do we attach the carboxyl on the surface of the uh, sensor? Okay, so instead of using amine just now, instead of using carboxyl, we can replace this with amine. Okay, let me go back. <coughs> so, um, okay, instead of using carboxyl, because carboxyl react with amine to form amide. So if it is antibody and we want we know that the antibody contain both eh, amine and carboxyl. But we want the carboxyl to attach to the sensor surface. So we just change it. <laughs> the, this one, this sensor or the carbon surface should be, should contain amine. <laughs> okay, so that it will uh, react to the, attach to the carboxyl group of antibody. Okay, so it's just like you have to play the chemistry. Okay, which one suits the, uh, how to attach. And if you think that you need amine, so you have to get the amine modified. If you need to get carboxyl, then you have to choose a proper compound that produce carboxyl compound on the uh, functional group on the surface of sensor. So you have to play with the chemistry. This is another chemistry, uh, covalent also, but this is using uh, thiol. Thiol is sulfur, okay? So you can see this is uh, DNA. So I, I did show you just now that we can also order DNA probe with thiol N, okay? With thiol N. So how to use that? Because usually thiol uh, or sulfur they have this affinity. They have this affinity uh, towards gold. Okay. They have this affinity towards gold. So uh, affinity means that they love gold. <laughs> Thiol, sulfur will automatically uh, bind itself to gold. Okay, they call it, uh, I, I don't know the mechanism, but they call it pseudo covalent. <laughs> okay, so uh, so imagine this is uh, the red the, the red dots uh, is thiol the the sulfur SH. Okay. Now you are trying to use it with gold. Eh? Uh, thiol. Okay. Does not work with carbon. Okay, most of the time. Uh, only work with gold surface, okay? So this technique is called self-assemble monolayer. What does it mean is uh, if you ordered uh, a thylated DNA, okay? Uh, you can just incubate. <laughs> you can just put it, uh, uh, dip it inside the DNA, okay? And they, the DNA will arrange itself like this, okay? The thiol, the SH, will automatically be on top of gold and the DNA will stand up. So this is probably a, a good chemistry, a simple but good chemistry. You don't have to worry about. Uh, but of course, there are issues like this one. It can happen as well, okay? So in order to prevent this, yeah? even though it's, it's, it's a simple uh, chemistry, you can just incubate and then automatically the, the thiol will attach to the gold. But in order to avoid these two um, orientation, unwanted orientation, 
we have to use what we call as a substrate passivation. Okay. What is substrate passivation? Is actually to space out. Uh, this one, eh? uh, the one that with green, red, green, red, this, uh, this is what we call as passivation of sensors. Okay. So we want to uh, make sure that this two uh, orientation will not happen. So this is an example. Uh, uh, of chemical compound that can use as what we call as a spacer. This is space, spacer. <laughs> uh, what is Merkab to? Um, Merkab to hexanol. I don't know. I, I'm not good in organic. <laughs> Zawa, yes. <laughs> okay, Mer uh, I don't. I don't know how to name this, but I know it's Merkab 2. <laughs> okay, so this uh, example, so, uh, if you want to use covalent chemistry, so these are the steps. Yeah? Uh, it's not that difficult. Uh, as I mentioned just now, the word is incubation. Uh, the, uh, it can, we can use alkene thiol just now. It's not alkene. Uh, is, it is, uh, is how many carbon is there? I'm not good in, in organic, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's not that difficult to do the immobilization process. <clears throat> okay, so I don't want to discuss this in detail, but at least you know uh, there are some issues or there are some challenges that, uh, that we have to face when we are talking about attaching the biomarker on the surface of sensor. So th this is another uh, possibility that we can choose to have uh, as a sensor surface, which is silicon. Eh? Because silicon, uh, there's a semiconductor characteristic, right? So, so this is an example <laughs> of how we uh, do uh, surface chemistry, okay, so starting from the silicon just now. And then we use aptus. Okay, aptus is uh, tetra. <laughs> the, the AP is quite long, so I know tetra silicate. Okay, where you can uh, where you can actually have a mine in the end, and then you can start uh, putting uh, the DNA after. Having glutaraldehyde so that the glutaraldehyde will will initiate the carboxyl, and then you can attach the DNA with those uh, aminated, yeah, aminated uh, DNA. So don't think it is too difficult, but there's a lot of protocol that you can just follow and then try. So it's not that uh, it's not that difficult. So the last issue that we need to think about is the how to avoid if we have a non-specific binding. So I mentioned just now that we have possibilities of other DNA, other DNAs from other species, or there's so many what we call as uh, they call it rubbish <laughs> proteins. How do we avoid them? How do we avoid them from interfering with sensor surface? Okay, so oh, this is Merkab to Hexanol. Okay, uh, and uh, one thing is when we put the spacer just now, okay, when we put the spacer, okay, the spacer is negative in charge. Okay, so one thing about uh, the organic, eh? uh, when we extract uh, blood or we extract from plant from uh, microbes, most of the proteins, most of the DNA, they are negative in charge, okay? So if we can passivate, if we can passivate or we can put negatively functional group on top of the sensor surface, this helps to repel the unwanted species, okay? So that's the most that we can do at this moment. We can do uh, surface uh, passivation uh, to 
repel the unwanted species. Yeah. This is called spacer, diluent, the same thing. Okay. So mercaptohexanol forces the basis of the surface of the goal. Okay. And the negatively charged DNA, the unwanted, is repelled from the surface by the negative dipoles of the alcohol. All right. Uh, this also means <laughs> there is a difficulty of the target DNA, the one that we want, also have difficulty to approach the probe DNA because of the spacer or diluent. But that's why. When we study uh, DNA biosensor, um, the response time yeah, uh, means that the incubation uh, will take some time. We'll take some, uh, a bit of uh, temperature. We need to increase the temperature to 30. And then we have to incubate uh, in uh, 40 minutes. Uh, okay, so that's why, because it requires time for the extracted DNA to come here because of the passivation as well. Eh? So what next that we can do is washing. Means that after incubation with the extracted sample, and we expect the target DNA will hybridize with the probe DNA. And we also expect there's other protein that interfere. What we can do is to do washing. So for those, uh, uh, for example, if it is antigen antibody interaction, they are very strong. So if even though if you wash, uh, it will stay there. But the one the unwanted species will wash away. Okay. And the hybridization that is strong also will stay there. And the uh, a weak interaction or a weak hybridization, if we wash them, it will. Uh, wash away. So these are the two things that we can do to prevent non-specific absorption. Washing is very crucial. Eh? Washing. So these are the things that we can also uh, modify uh, in order to have a good response. You can see that this is the spacer, the length of the spacer. We can also study the length of the spacer. And this is the DNA probe. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, sometimes it's good to have a very long DNA probe because it, it is more accessible. Eh? It is more accessible. If it is too short, the extracted DNA will have a difficulty to approach the uh, DNA probe. Yeah? So the rate of utilization uh, is naturally important. Okay? This one has to be optimized, has to be studied which length is the most optimum, is the most suitable, okay? <clears throat> so this one requires uh, detailed study. Uh, density, okay, not too much, not too, uh, uh, not too low in amounts. So it has to be just nice. Eh? So the DNA probe, the diluent, the spacer, okay? And then uh, hybridization temperature or even the antibody uh, ant antigen interaction, they requires a bit of heat, okay? Uh, because this is quite normal for a biomolecule to work. Uh, this is due to the kinetic. If we understand kinetic, it requires energy to move, okay? So if it is like very cold, five degrees, then it will not happen. So it has to be like 25. 30 above, okay? So that, re that requires, huh? that is needed for the interaction to happen, right? Okay. Okay, this one, uh, this is an old assignment. So I think uh, I'm gonna discuss the assignment uh, during next lecture. So what we have covered is until uh, the first objective, just a moment. Okay, the first objective, uh, which is on the fundamental, 